Hello students, it's your history teacher. The last lecture was about uh, the Vikings, Islamic Empire and the Crusades. And I'd like to continue with our online lectures on a regular basis two times a week, as long as it is the only possibility to give you an explanation of the topic. I know it's more difficult for you to study on your own and to focus on important details of each topic. That's why I've decided to do this. So today's topic will be Medieval France. Medieval France was established only in the half of the 9th century, so in 843, uh, after the Treaty of Verdun. You should be already familiar with the Treaty of Verdun, which divided the Frankish Empire. Do not mistake Medieval France with the Frankish Empire. France was only the western part of the Frankish Empire that was inherited by Charles the Bold. Uh, we know that there was the middle part inherited by Lothar and the eastern part inherited by Louis the German. Okay, so now we're talking about the western part of the French Empire, which, or Frankish Empire, that finally happened to be medieval France, soon to be called after the Treaty of Verdun. Charles the Bald and his descendants, so his sons and grandsons and the next kings of France, were very weak. And this was mostly according to the law that allowed the nobles to have fifth hereditary. So this meant that they could inherit it from a son from his father. So it was passed from father to his son and so on. This was something what really made king weaker. This is because when king has his nobles, they are loyal to him. But when they are not afraid to lose their fief, so their land they were given by the king, they are trying to seize the power. So at least something more so they are big when king is becoming weakened they the nobles are becoming stronger okay it's like that aby som vám to zahrnula po slovensky král má iba takú silu akých bohatých má v podstate svojich šlachticov on im dáva leno oni namiesto toho sú mu verní a dávajú mu svojich vojakov peniaze da niektoré vyberajú a tak ďalej. Vieme, ako funguje ten feudálny systém. Pokiaľ vlastne šlachtici sa cítia, že to leno už držia vo svojej moci, lebo ho dedia, tak vlastne prestávajú voči tomu kráľovi byť lojálni a nejakým spôsobom zaviazaní, vďační za tú pôdu. Okay? So, this was, uh, the situation was unstable because of the nobles and it was so, until the next king, uh, Hugo Capet, was elected, he was, uh, you're seeing it right, he was elected, so he didn't inherit the crown from his father. This was because uh, the nobles basically choose him, so we can see he was elected by some of them, because, uh, like, according to his abilities, and he founded Capetian dynasty. The uh, kings, the previous kings of France, were still from the Carolinian dynasty, from the Frankish Empire, because they were sons of Charles the Bold, who was a uh, grandson of Carloman, and so on. Okay, so the Capetian dynasty is basically the first real dynasty of just medieval France and not Frankish Empire. Uh, Capetian dynasty, and especially Hugo Capet, started to have power that was supported by the church and cities. Church and cities, both of these had money to support the king. Cities could, for example, provide money from trading, from raising taxes, from, uh, they could, you know, provide army and people, craftsmen and everything they had, and the church had religious authority. So we know that for Middle Ages it's very important. And all, both of these two supported the king, Hugo Capet. But the nobles 
still were making some problems because they realized like Hugo Cap is quite a strong leader and so on so they were still making some conflicts in the country. So they stayed undone until Philip II August broke their power and even more Philip the Fourth the Fair, Philip Stwerti Pekni, consolidated the situation even more. So he put everything into the order. Uh, Philip the Fourth the Fair kinda really helped the situation to get better to improve his position as a king. But he started to have conflict with some important institution and that was the church. Philip IV had conflicts with Boniface VIII who was Pope at that time and this Pope issued the bull Unem Sanctum in the beginning of the 14th century. Bull is legal document with a seal, okay, type of legal document and this bull declared papal supremacy over all monarchs so not just over Fran French monarchs but over all of them like in whole Europe. Uh, of course Philip IV didn't like that idea because it meant that he was weakened uh, so he had even like the, the conflict got deeper. Uh, this argue peaked in like after one year when the Pope was slapped in the face of course not by the king you know he was slapped across the face so he was attacked by Giacomo Colonna and this was member of important like noble family and it caused to the Pope of course great public humiliation but not just for him personally but for all of the church because you know the Pope is the man who is the highest in the hierarchy of Christianity and to do something like that is very disgraceful you know like it's a disgrace to do something like that uh, the Pope Boniface VIII died shortly after it was said that he died due to the humiliation but it was not like that he died probably uh, because of uh, kidney stone and fever that was caused by uh, by this kidney stone and uh, the next Pope who took his place was Clement V but he was only a puppet to znamená, že bol ako bábka, čiže bol nasadený, aby ho mohli využívať, aby ho král mohol využiť tak, ako potrebuje, čiže nebol nejaký silný, ktorý by sa vzopieral práve tej svedskej moci, ktorú reprezentoval král. During this period, because of how weak was Clement V, the era of Avignon papacy started and lasted for 67 years. This will be explained in the video within this video, so let's watch. The origins of the Avignon Papacy began with Pope Clement V and King Philip IV. King Philip IV and his ancestors of the throne have been manipulating the papacy's decisions since the beginning of the Frankish Kingdom. The French have been a major factor in the papacy since the beginning of the Frankish Kingdom, and it is no surprise that another Frenchman in Clement V was elected as Pope. Because of Clement's strong relationship with Philip IV, he decided it was time for a change. He moved the papal capital from Rome to Avignon, France. While in Avignon, the papacy enjoyed an influx of great wealth because the French king was flourishing at the time. Clement and his successor John XXII were living the life of a celebrity, but one event would begin to damage the image of the papacy and the church, the 100 Years' War. This war between the English and French began to extremely damage the papal image. All of a sudden, under Pope Benedict XII, the papacy's land, money, palace, and even the people were at risk. Siding with the French was extremely detrimental to the papacy because they were known for not being the greatest warriors. <laughs> oh, the Crusades. So then, one, two, three popes later, the war is still going on, which then brings us to Pope Gregory XI. Pope Gregory decided to go back to the papacy's roof, so he, along with Catherine of Siena and St. Bridget of Sweden and a few others, moved the papacy back to Rome. But this sweet homecoming was spoiled because the French never officialized the move back to Rome. So for a short while, there were two popes. 
The two lines of the papacy feuded, but I'm not the one covering that topic. For Philip the Fourth, the Fair, this conflict with the Church was not the only conflict during his lifetime. He was also responsible for abolition of the Knight Templars, who were the Knights, the, the military order that protected Christians, the pilgrims, on their way to Jerusalem, the Holy Land, and they also were fighting the Crusades. You know, these men, they made fortune in Holy Land, and their power was rising in France, and Philip, Philip IV wanted to stop that. And that is why he decided to arrest these people and burn them alive. One thing is how he can afford this, you know, how he, I mean, how did he manage to do so, to just decide that now he will just murder basically whole military order of knights. You know, this happened because Clement V was really only a puppet and he was willing to sign also other documents. Philip IV said that the Templars were actually heretics, so this means that people without religion, like no, like non-believers. To su kacieri, čiže niekto, kto napríklad čarodejnice, alebo teda takí, ktorí, ono sa to hovorilo, že obcujú s diablom. Hej, čiže ne, vlastne robia niečo nečisté. And he decided to burn them alive as witches, because this was a punishment for you know, heretics to burn them alive, because it was said that they can't be just killed normally, but they had to be burned. This incident happened on Friday the 13th. It sounds familiar, right? Friday the 13th. Uh, well, during this day, there were all of these people were arrested. And when they were burning, their leader told Philip that he will die within one year and one day from that moment because it was evil what he did. It is legend we're not sure if that really happened but it's in chronicles and actually philip the fourth died within this time so uh friday the 13th is internationally considered to be day of bad luck and we will see a video about uh, this origin what actually happened so let's watch it now, again, video within the video. 1291 and the Mamluks have conquered Acre. Defence of the Holy Land over the past couple of centuries had fallen to the militant holy orders, the most famous of them all being the Order of the Temple, the Knights Templar. After the fall of Acre, the Templars fled to Cyprus and from there many of them returned to Europe. Over the next year, the Order desperately sought the backing of the Pope and other European monarchs to support them in another crusade to retake the Holy Land. This help wasn't forthcoming and so the Knights Templar had a bit of an identity crisis. It was an order which existed to protect pilgrims moving to, from and within the Holy Land and without a Holy Land what were they supposed to do? The Knights Templar were also operated in Europe via a series of temples and banks which together made the Order extremely, extremely wealthy. Also, the money they lent gave them considerable leverage over the people in their debt. Philippe IV of France was one such debtor and he was worried about the Templars turning their attention to European affairs. The Templars also had the backing of the Pope, Boniface VIII, whom Philippe had been feuding with for a while now. Fortunately, Philippe and Boniface would work out their differences, by which I mean Philippe would have the Pope kidnapped and he would soon after his release die. In 1305, a new Pope, Clement V, was elected and invited the Grand Master of the Templars, Jacques de Molay, to meet him to discuss a brand new crusade. This crusade never happened and this meant that King Philippe could criticise the Order's conduct since if they weren't trying to retake the Holy Land, then why did they need all of that wealth, or even to exist? Philippe decided to strike at the order, especially now that its leaders were in France. 
The main reason was because there had been accusations of heresy against the order that totally weren't orchestrated by Philippe, and wasn't at all because Philippe owed them a gigantic sum of money and didn't want to pay it back or because they had a bunch of land and property he could seize. It was all about religion. On Friday the 13th, 1307, Philippe's men arrested any Templar they could find across France, which included Malay. The Pope was now furious since the Templars answered to him. After a fair bit of torture, many Templars, including de Malay, confessed to being heretics. Malay retracted his confession and so the Pope decided to delay their trial. By 1310, Philippe was getting extremely impatient and so had 54 Templars burned at the stake. This was to preempt the Templars building a legal defence for themselves. The implications were clear. Admit your guilt and spend the rest of your life in prison or a monastery, or protest your innocence and be burned. For most Templars, this was enough. The Pope acquiesced and Templars were arrested all across Europe and their lands were to be seized until their guilt was determined. In 1311, and under immense pressure from Philippe, Clement V summoned a council to determine what was to be done with the Templars. After no one could agree, the Pope threatened anyone who disagreed with him with excommunication and the next year the order was suppressed. The Knights Templar were no more. The Templar's property across Europe was to be handed over to another military order, the Knights Hospitaller whom Philippe promptly extorted for lots of money. In 1314, Jacques de Molay was still in French custody and the Pope set up a committee to determine his guilt to which Molay declared his innocence. Philippe was frankly done with this whole Templar business by this point and so before the Pope could do anything he had Molay burned at the stake. The last Grand Master of the Templars was gone, having outlived his order by two years, a pretty grim end for an order which had been held in such high esteem across the centuries. Interesting, right? After Capetian dynasty died out, everything got even worse. Mainly conflicts between France and England, because um, France and England had some argues about land and territories. For example, a lot of land in France was actually that some kings of England claim, had some claims over this territory and also the French king had claims on all of the England because William the Conqueror that we mentioned him during the Vikings topic but I will mention him uh, once again uh, he was actually Norman he was from France and he became king of England so this meant that also other kings from France they started to have claims on the English throne and also vice versa. This resulted in the, one of the biggest conflicts of Middle Ages and it is called Hundred Years War and it will be our next topic next week. Okay, thank you for watching, it's all for now. Please study on a regular basis and stay home, stay healthy and bye.